Good day, mates. I'm Buckaroo Billy, and today I'm going to discuss the topic of Australian cinema, with its crocodile dundees and BMX bandits and hanging rocks and... Okay, forget it. I'm not going to create a new character. And I'm pretty sure I just offended an Australian or two. Anyway, as I was saying, today we're going to take a trip down under and look at just a sampling of what the Australian film industry has had to offer. To ease you into the world of Aussie Hollywood, let's look at its biggest successes. Paul Hogan's fish out of water comedy, Crocodile Dundee, has the right amount of charm and humor, and many thanks to Hogan's excellent performance carrying the film. He brings such an immense likability to Mick Dundee, and a large part of the fun is seeing him get used to the New York lifestyle. However, the love story brings the right heart to a film that might otherwise have been a series of gags about an outback man in the Big Apple. The sequels never came close to the strength of the first Crocodile Dundee, and even though its popularity has eased since the late 80s, I think it still holds up remarkably well. Another massive success is one you wouldn't think of as Australian, and that's Babe. An endlessly charming and feel-good film, Babe is simply a great story of a pig who fought the odds and showed that being nice actually can help you succeed in life. Though these are essentially talking animals, they are fascinating creatures and each one has its own individual personality to them. Christine Cavanaugh is particularly warm as Babe, evoking the right emotion to the little pig. Of the human actors, James Cromwell is able to convey so much thought even without saying a word. Anybody who doesn't get the heart warmed or become inspired by the end of this simply does not have a heart to begin with. One of the most acclaimed Australian filmmakers is Peter Weir, who you may know is the director of The Truman Show, Witness, and Mess Commander. However, his big break came in the Australian period piece, Picnic and Hanging Rock. It's incredibly haunting with Peter Weir being so delicate when he tells his story and does it with a necessary mystery. Nothing is laid out in the open here, and yet Weir succeeds in not making that frustrating. So many theories run through one's head afterwards, and to be honest, I think this is more about the girls who did not disappear, rather than those who did. The simple act of them getting lost at Hang Rock leads to a sense of madness from everybody else. The fault of this is really the headmistress and a dictatorial reign, which leads to it to be a story of mystery, or maybe something more. All this is highlighted through Russell Boyd's great cinematography and an excellent soundtrack peppered with classical music. Picnic and Hanger Rock could have become a stuffy corset piece, and Weir makes it so wonderfully unique and different. Another notable work from a famed director is Michael Powell's Age of Consent. With its lush Australian beach setting and two strong performances in front, Age of Consent works on a number of levels. James Mason gives a strong performance in lead, but the true scene stealer is a young Helen Mirren. Every time she's on screen, it's not hard to see why she would soon become one of the most celebrated British actresses. With Cora, she oddly manages to display both young innocence and a sexual intensity whenever she appears. The relationship between her and Brad is a believable one, as the two share a bond, albeit with slight differences among them. Director Powell and screenwriter Priya Yeldum are able to successfully show this, and the sprinkles of humor add to the story. This could have been another Lolita story, and it wouldn't have been Mason's first either, but Powell is able to make it an original and well-developed tale. One of the most interesting filmmakers to come out of Australia is probably Baz Luhrmann. He has that impressive ability in taking familiar stories and making them fresh in unique ways. He brings such an intense visual style that the openings take a while to get used to, but then it's easy to go along the ride. His first film was Strictly Ballroom, which tackles a strange world of ballroom dancing and crafts a touching romance, a common theme of Luhrmann's. From there, he adapted Shakespeare with Romeo and Juliet, placing it in a gang-filled modern-day Verona beach, and it could have easily failed, but it actually managed to work, even though the sight of modern gang members reciting the classic dialogue appears odd at first. He directed easily his best work with Moulin Rouge, one of my favorite musicals. Utilizing the jukebox musical with the right approach, it's a star-crossed lover story, but it feels like a whole new story, and the visual splendor of it is magnificent, as are the performances from Hugh McGregor and Nicole Kidman. Lerman's most recent effort was, appropriately enough, Australia, a sort of a Gone with the Wind style epic centering on the impact of World War II on Australia. It may start off rocky, but as it goes along, the story becomes more evolving, and Lerman calms down his direction. Nicole Kidman's performance is sadly lacking, but Hugh Jackman is a great male lead, and the romance between him and Kidman is well-developed and heartfelt. 
The film is also a visual feat with Mandy Walker's cinematography putting the right glow on the landscape as does Catherine Martin's production design. Admittedly, it has its set of flaws, like the villain being so cliched I'm surprised it didn't tie Kidman to the railroad tracks, but as a whole, I managed to get swept up in the adventure. Speaking of Kidman, her first film role was in the wonderfully cheesy 80s romp BMX Bandits. Sure has bad dialogue and poor acting all around, but still manages to hold a certain charm and excitement. The bicycle chase sequences are excellent, especially the cinematography by John Seal, and provide the most fun moments in the whole film. The stunt work also deserves a claim. So what it lacks in character and story, it makes up for in the action. It's also very obviously stuck in the 1980s, even down to the synchronizer keyboard score and metallic title logo, and that adds further charm to this production. BMX Bandits has the right amount of fun Australian B-movie sensibilities. For more serious 80s Australian cinema, there's A Cry in the Dark, about one of the most infamous court cases in the country's history. Targeting how the media can change the public's perception on a person, this also works as a solid courtroom drama, held together by Meryl Streep giving her accent of the week. Most people simply remember this for the dingo took my baby line, but there is a lot more to this film that adds to its success. Also, kudos to Sam Neill for his performance as a stressed out husband of Lindy Chamberlain. In the past decade, Australia continues to grow in its film industry with new major actors starting out over there, like with the indie hit Somersault. A quite little Australian film, Somersault is a calming sort of film whose glacial pace might annoy others, but I thought was necessary in developing the atmosphere. A large part of the film's success is in the sweet relationship between the two leads. Abby Cornish is excellent, doing a great job of showing the uncertainty and insecurities of Heidi and the troubles that fall into her life. Sam Worthington is also very good, a far cry from the action hero role he has been typecast in. There is a later plot point I don't think was needed as I felt there should have been more focus on the uncertain romance between Heidi and Joe. Nonetheless, it's a different sort of film that certainly stays on the mind. One of the most successful and unexpected comedy hits also led to a new talent making it big. Kenny stars Shane Jacobson as a plumber taking part in a documentary focusing on the deals of his life and the crazy happenings that occur. Jacobson brings an immense likability to the part and the character of Kenny brings a sense of pride to doing his job, despite it not being the most appealing, but hey, somebody has to do it. Even though this is literally toilet humor, it's not overtly crude and even holds a certain charm. Since the release of Kenny, Jacobson has become one of the biggest homegrown Australian actors, including starring alongside Paul Hogan in the film Charlie and Boots. Showcasing these two actors, taking a break from their usual images of Australian adventurers, Charlie and Boots is at its best during its comedic set pieces. Humorously detailing the occasional agony of long road trips, the screenplay is episodic in nature, but it works in this case. There are plenty of laughs to be had, from swerving away from pork on the road to the fun of vandalism. Both Shane Jacobson and Paul Hogan play off each other very well, and their father-son relationship is believable. However, the film tends to slow down during the more dramatic points, and while those story elements are important, I wanted it to return to the funny. And when it sticks with the funny, it works quite well. Interesting enough, Shane Jacobson almost played Curly in the recent Three Stooges film adaptation. Meanwhile, if you're interested in looking at a completely different side of Australian filmmaking, I highly recommend Not Quite Hollywood, a wild, untold story of Ozploitation, a fascinating documentary on the grindhouse scene down under, precisely detailing the madness that went into making these films. With insightful comments from the likes of George Miller, John Seale, and Quentin Tarantino, the enthusiasm of the interviews just leaps off the screen to the point of wanting to seek some of these out. The editing also deserves a mention for telling the story of Ozploitation in a way that never gets repetitive and never once falls into backslapping praise. Director Mark Hatley is smart at looking at the cinema honestly while still with the necessary affection. This is definitely a must-see, especially if you're a fan of the joyful quality of B-grade Anything Goes pictures. Now as a special bonus, I'm going to discuss an Australian television series called Rake. A lot of crime shows on television too many in fact, but Rake actually has a humorous element to it that gives it an added layer of enjoyment. Richard Roxburgh, who you may recognize as the Duke from Moulin Rouge, does a superb job as Cleaver Green, a lawyer with a completely different way of tackling his cases. The show handled its dramatic aspects really well, but the comedic parts are what sell Rake in being really strong. I find myself unexpectedly laughing multiple times per episode, and a large part of that is because of Roxburgh's massive charm and timing. 
The guest actor is also well handled, with Hugo Weaving being at his most devilish in the premiere episode. If Gamanche can hold the series, it's worth a look. So as you can see, there's a lot more to Australian culture than just koalas, kangaroos, and Outback Steakhouse. Though, Outback Steakhouse is amazing. But that's besides the point. If you haven't delved into the Aussie film industry, it's worth checking some of these titles out. And there's probably countless others I haven't even seen yet. See you next time.